This is Legends with Bevo. Thanks to Anytime Fitness Glenelg. And now, here's your host, Bevo. Isabella Rossitano now. You might remember her from SAS Hell Week. Muhammad Ali, the great, um, unfortunately no longer with us, boxer and is a big influence of yours. Just started boxing. I started it very recently. I, I only started boxing just before SAS, a month or two before SAS. So my first official fight was on SAS against a six foot three guy. Um, and that went pretty well. I got knocked down twice, but I got up again. And I uh, well also done. never got to keep me down. Uh, <laughs> and, and I also I also got a pretty cool combo shot, which was inspired by Tyson when uh, he went in with the right hook. I went underneath and gave a few body shots and that felt really good. I was keen to go first because yeah. I knew before going onto that show if we were fighting I would pick the biggest guy to fight that's amazing yeah. and, and you probably would have gained that respect from not only him but the rest of the people on the show as yes. well yeah you know, I which, did yeah. yeah it's true yeah, yeah. thank you uh, but getting back to Muhammad Ali though yeah, why why Muhammad why why do you sort of like him so much and why was he such an idol for you and as soon as you mentioned his name I just think you know I'm so mean I murdered a rock <laughs> injured a stone hospitalized a brick I'm so mean I make medicine sick I'm bad man I'm bad. I'm fast. These could be in your rap songs. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. I mean, I just think, I think he, the thing about combat sports is you don't have an ego and you really respect the sport and to be a master of your sport, a technician of it. Muhammad Ali was a great technician. And on top of that, he had that the beautiful speeches, the way he's the way he spoke, almost like a rapper. You know, it's about like getting your lyrics out, getting your message out. Muhammad Ali had a message, and he always got that out. And the way he spoke was so eloquent. Even though I've heard that, you know, maybe he didn't write all his speeches. I'm not sure, but what he did say when he said it was always powerful. I think he was just as powerful with his words as he was with his boxing. And that's that's you know, isn't that? Amazing. So true. Fight like a butterfly, sting like a bee. That's Absolutely. my favourite. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that's yeah. that's why. And I think he's probably, like, I think Tyson obviously got a bit from Ali and I think all boxers look up to Ali and I would look up to, you know, to for me I'm looking up at Tyson, looking up at Ali and uh, wherever my future in boxing, boxing or fighting sports lies, those are the people I have huge inspiration from. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. All right, Izzy, this next segment is called Big Failures yep. and What You've Learned. You were very close to going to Tokyo 2020, mm. and it's quite sad in terms of the situation there, and that was with canoeing. Mm. And I was poor, I don't know how you do it all. Um, but explain the situation there and, and sort of how you felt when you found out that you sort of hadn't mm. qualified knowing that you were so close. Mm. That was definitely, in terms of, yeah, regrets or anything like that, I think I always knew that, I think I always knew it was going to happen like that. I had a feeling that no matter how hard I tried or how good I was at the sport, that I wasn't someone who was, you know, I don't know how to say this, <laughs> um, who was looked upon favourably perhaps. I have no family connections in the sport. I feel like the people who were looked upon favourably do. Now, I like to think that things change and I like to think that maybe one day this sport in Australia will be different and people will all be given a fair go. But the stories I've heard even after leaving are perhaps even worse than what I went through. I gave, so I gave canoeing my best shot to try and go to the Olympics. That's definitely something I'd love to do one day, but I realise it's not something that we can, um, we, it's not a good goal to have. You know, like if you were to, if you were to ask me, in 2016, when I'd had a one-year AIS scholarship to make Tokyo, what is your goal as an athlete? I would have looked at you, I would have smiled, and I would have said, I want to win a gold medal at the Olympics. That's what I would have said. I think that's completely out of any athlete's control. It's, I used to think it was, it was about being the best, working as hard as you can, and the person who worked the hardest got there. It's not like that. And I think that's the message I do want to share with with all athletes is, you know, it's such a matter of luck and other external influences. I think, um, you know, for me now, my goal with whatever sport I'm doing is to be the best technician I can be and to have that that satisfaction from knowing like, you know, for example, boxing, I came a long way, especially after doing a training camp. 
in New Zealand with some really great fighters and some really great coaches and that feeling of enjoying the journey along the way was so important because that's 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 the bit that's that takes up the most time you don't know when you're going to have your moment of success or how long it's going to be for with canoeing it 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 unfortunately wasn't like that and to be honest it's taken me till 2022 now to to speak up about a bit more freely about what that sport was actually like for me and my experience of it and it wasn't positive it wasn't it wasn't really that great so i have never really spoken out about that but i think especially after the passing of harley ballick which breaks my mm. heart really that that hit me really hard um <laughs> you know just thinking about it now um i think it's important that we do kind of share all aspects of sport and yeah. unfortunately unfortunately like in terms of it's quite hard to answer that question but i think i knew I knew deep down that I wasn't going to get an opportunity, but I'm so happy. I'm so happy that I came back. I actually left the sport for a while in 2018. I thought I'm done. It's not worth the negativity. It's not worth the pain just to try and make it to the Olympics. That's not worth it. But then I I thought to myself, well, I'm two years away. I'm going to give it everything I've got. And no matter what happens, no matter what the outcome is, I know that I gave it 110%. And that's what that's what I did, and I think I know that I gave it my best shot, and uh, that's all. That's all you can do as an athlete. So I'm really happy about that. Uh, I guess I feel now like if I put that same effort and that same uh, mindset into something like boxing, I think I think I'd be sitting here with a great number of um, more success. tangible achievements and more yeah. success. I think I yeah. think my biggest failure was not knowing when to quit. Yeah. And uh, I think a great thing I read recently was like, don't quit, you know, because, you know, of X, Y, Z, but quit because it sucks. Like quit when, you know, you're not in the right environment, that you're not, you know, you're not supported to achieve and all that. And that is something I'd say to athletes. And uh, I'm very lucky that I managed to extend myself into different sports. I would love to commit everything to one sport. And I think after doing canoe, I kind of realized the reason I was having an issue with, you know, kind of committing to it was simply because of the environment that I was in. It wasn't a happy environment. It wasn't a good environment. And yeah, I mean, it is what it is. I'm so grateful for it because it's made me who I am. So does that make yeah. you more determined though to have another yep. crack? Absolutely. And, um, yeah. So, but not not canoeing no yeah. more, more boxing. Yeah, or- definitely. Yeah. I had, I had again, a thought in my head about 2017 when, canoeing doesn't work out, I'm going to do boxing and I'm going to be really good. So no more canoeing now after that? Yeah, well, Ant told me to come. Ant told me, you know, you should really give it another crack. Like you are a good, you are good at this, you know. Yeah. And obviously I didn't really Unfinished tell- business as well. Yeah, yeah, unfinished yeah. business. Yeah, for real. Um, I forced myself to go out on the water on the 1st of January, which was really emotional, um, but it was beautiful. I thought to myself, I still got it because it's quite a difficult thing to stay straight and to steer, but it just, it, 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 it did come back to me a lot. It was quite a windy day and I just couldn't believe like that feeling of being out and gliding on the water was really nice. And uh, I am thinking about going and just getting back on the water um, for the uh, Victorian State Championships in a week. So, awesome. yeah, just to be back on the water. Yeah, it's a it's a beautiful thing. So it will be interesting to see where that goes. Yeah. And in terms of the failures as well, because mm. you, t- you touched on what you've been through mm. um, in terms of, of Harley, we'll sort of speak about mm. that in a moment. But in terms of the actual show itself, mm. The, I was just amazed, and I'm sure the whole of Australia, or people that were watching the show, at you know just how tough it was, and and you were just doing, you were just going through absolute hell and back, and yeah. the show was called Hell Week, of course. And yeah, some very of the challenge, aptly. So, some of the challenges were yeah. just unbelievable, and a lot of people, like even strong guys, weren't able to do, but you just kept pushing through. How did you push through those failures and and just mentally push through when you just when your body was saying no, you know, when your head was saying no, but yeah. how you actually kept pushing through with those yeah. ridiculous challenges that a lot of people yeah. would have just quit yeah. and, and did quit earlier yeah. than you. Yeah, and yeah. talking like big, yeah. strong, muscly men as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. true. I was never going to quit. I think I was never <laughs> going to quit. And it's funny because I can say that now, sitting in this comfortable chair in this studio, because before when we were doing the interview for SAS before we went on, I got big camera in there and they ask you all the questions and the camera goes, or the camera woman goes, do you, would you quit? And I, and I said to her, 
it's so easy for me right now to tell you while I'm sitting in this really comfortable <laughs> chair, while I've had some water, while I've got water, while I've eaten, while I've slept, even though I, ironically today, obviously, as you know, I've had about three hours sleep the last two nights. <laughs> um, for me to tell you that I'm not going to quit when things are hard. That's easy to say when we're not in the situation. I, I've been reflecting, obviously, on the on that, but I did say I don't believe I would. I can't imagine quitting. I can't imagine quitting. If something is going to make me so destroyed that I'm going to quit, wow, like that must be an amazing experience because that's going to be something next level to make me quit. That's what I said before going on the show. After doing it, I reflect on it and I think to myself, I don't know. The third night was the night when I remember thinking, if we have a bee sting tonight, I don't know how I'm going to do it. And I thought to myself of my family, especially my my grandparents, I really wish I had more time with them. And they they went through, obviously, my family on up those generations were affected massively by World War One and World War Two and other wars and other conflicts. And I thought, what have my ancestors gone through? You know, we're, we're living in this life so far from conflict in Adelaide in Australia. Yeah. We're very lucky to have that. And I've always, I've sort of thought about that most of my life. How lucky am I, you know, and. Um, well said. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. I think I just didn't want to quit. I, I don't, I don't quit. It wasn't an option going into there. It wasn't an option and I never did quit and reflecting on it, I don't know, like it's pretty insane when I see, because you don't see like, obviously, especially because I'm scared of heights, especially yeah. doing the cat climb, I did not look down. I did not, which is a shame because it was a beautiful view. I love views. <laughs> I love beautiful views and I couldn't. I was like, just look down the road. Um, and yeah, it's just, I think it wasn't an option. I thought of my family and I just, yeah, it's it's proved to myself that I'm that I'm a resilient, even through the sports experience I had. I think that you know that showed me that I didn't quit, you know. And I think I just think it's it's something that I don't know. I feel like it's inherent, and it was in me. I think it's from my ancestors. I do. I really do. They didn't quit. They managed to get their families out to safety, and I think it's from them. Yeah, absolutely, it has to be. It's yeah, am- it's amazing, inspiring. <laughs> yeah. yeah, good yeah. on you. Thanks, yeah, yeah. Um, this next segment is is called. It's okay not to be okay. Now, you mentioned before about Harley mm. Bailey, and um, sadly passed away recently, mm. was a Freo Dockers player and, you know, got delisted like a lot of mm. young AFL players do. And, mm. and it's also, I guess, like, where to from here for mm. them? And, and that's probably the, the challenge, I guess, mm. in the end that you probably know this more than anyone, though. But tell us about your relationship with Harley and, mm. and why it sort of cut you so deep. Mm. I think um, the thing about Harley and, yeah, it's pretty gutting to know that you know, someone like him has gone is the fact that his passing is so symbolic of so many sports people around the world and maybe so many people who follow their dream around the world who at some point they're no longer chasing it, whether that's for a a small amount of time or for a long amount of time. I think that's the reason that his passing hit so many people really hard and and that feeling was uh, captured by a... um, another ex-AFL player called Jamo Daniels, and I might read out some of his words later. So for me, in 2016, uh, I was competing in canoe and uh, in Perth, and one day I was going for a walk after the competition with my dad, and I saw this cool football oval, and I used to always travel with my Sharon. I actually love – I that was one thing I did as a hobby. At the moment, I'm into just heading down to a basketball court and – throwing the ball at the backboard really (laughs) but I used to be into taking my Sharon and having a little bit of a handball and a bit of a kick saw this great football oval and my dad was there and I thought why don't we go see what that is and it looked pretty big I thought dad I think this is the Frio Dockers (laughs) he goes no 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 it's just a it's just a small club anyway it turns out it's the Frio Dockers and they're having a open an open I don't know what we call it an open day and uh they're kicking and so we watched them and Harley was there and afterwards, we, we got to meet them. When I met Harley, you know, he was such a happy, funny, nice person. And we've got a photo together. And I looked at that photo, especially again after hearing that he's no longer here. And I just saw two two sports people or two two humans chasing their dreams at a really good point in their careers. Like we both at that point in 2016, like that was his second year. I think he was before an injury. And for me, that was actually the first year I made an Australian team. And just 
just I looked at that photo, what it symbolized. And to think that, you know, we both, um, you know, we both went then into similar paths of losing that for a while. Like I'm dev- devastated that he was in a place that he couldn't keep going. Like that's devastating. And I think there's so many like people who, who are in that situation in Australia and should have worn waterproof mascara. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's it's just really sad because, again, like you look at that photo and it's like he's so happy and healthy, you know, and it's like I think that's what it's like when you're at a time when you're following your passion and you know your goal and you're looking at it and you're going for it and it's the best feeling in the world. You know what you're going to wake up and do. You're going to wake up and you're going to go to training for your goal. You know, you're going to wake up, you're going to dedicate everything to your goal. And that's what he was doing and that's what we were doing and then no longer having that, you don't know what's going on in someone's life. I can't comment on why he's no longer here, but I can't help but think that as an athlete it was something to do with not having that that goal. And uh, I think that's what J-Mo touched on as well and that's why, you know, I hope he, uh, he is at peace now. But, like, that's why this story is, this this passing is pretty confronting confronting for a lot of people i'd say a lot of people like the amount of yeah i'd say the amount of especially like afl they they're earning money from it you know like they know they can make a living from it like and and like you said doing what they love as well yeah getting paid to pay ridiculous money to chase their dream and doing what they love and yeah next thing you know it's taken away and yeah yeah like i said it's it's brutal and Mm. it's such a sad and so young as well Mm. to pass so absolutely yeah. so yeah condolences to you know obviously his his family and everybody yeah yeah well said mm. yeah um just our final segment tonight izzy this one is called now i'm in the big time now i'm in the big time um ed middleton's yeah, always yeah. been uh, a big idol of yours as, as a kid you used yeah. to watch the sas yeah, yeah, shows yeah, yeah. before yeah. it was a reality tv mm. show mm. and mm. you know you, you've always looked up to him and mm. You saw this big mountain of a bloke right up in your face yelling at you <laughs> and swearing at you and, and we'll be watching on TV thinking, oh my goodness, this guy's pretty intimidating. You actually like, you loved it and said he's a big teddy bear. Like, tell us about this. Remember before how I said some people have different sides to them? Um, definitely, uh, oh, oh, my apologies to staff if you hear this. <laughs> Please don't yell at me again. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so I used to watch SAS as a teenager on YouTube. So this is back when it was like the original UK series and uh, it was just tremendous to me and it was like such a documentary like of seeing these guys absolutely destroyed, like destroyed. Like they had one series in a jungle and these are all British British men, so they all like melting. Uh, <laughs> you know, they had one series like in the snow and uh, it was never available for women until 2018, I think. And when it was first available for women, I actually tried to apply, even though I'm in Australia, you had to have a UK citizenship, but I actually applied anyway because I thought, who knows, I'm like, I might get a shot. But that's how much I wanted to do SAS. Wow. Then in 2019, I think it was, or 2020, all of a sudden it was in Australia and that blew my mind. It was only for celebrities, but I was like, whoa, like what's it doing here? And I wish I'd watched it because it would have given me more of an insight into how it's run in Australia which is a bit different to the UK. But anyway, long story short, um, 2021, I ended up having this opportunity to go on the show that I loved as a teenager. And I'm not sure, was there a reality show you ever watched growing up that you thought you want to do or? Yeah, well, I applied to Big Brother a couple of times. Did you? Oh, yeah. you'd be great on Big Brother. I can tell you. <laughs> so, many people, so many people have said Oh, that. I want to see you on Big Brother. I think it's Channel 7. Is that on Channel 7? It Channel is on 7. Channel 7. Yeah. Oh, but it's all changed now. It's a bit like Survivor now because it's become such a, a tactical a tactical it, show. It has. Which I'd be hopeless. I'd yes. get eliminated straight yeah. away. So. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. That's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, nah, um, I think, uh, no, you'd be great on Big Brother. But yeah, if you imagine, like, I was such a fan of the show. That's how I would describe it. Like I was, a, that was probably the show for me that I was always like, I would love to give that a shot. I would love to give it a shot. I just thought it looked like the hardest thing imaginable. <laughs> I did not ever imagine that I would have that opportunity. Even now, especially like after it aired and all that, I've just been sitting back and thinking, like when I look at the photos of me and Anne, me and Billy, Foxy or Ollie, I'm like, I actually did that. I actually had that opportunity to go on this show 
and I that blows my mind. Um, and like when I used to watch the show, this is a, this is an interesting thing. This is a thing I think Anne would be happy with me sharing is like when I watched the shows, I used to think Ant was arrogant. I used to think he, I, I used to think to myself. He's arrogant. When I watch the shows, he's so not arrogant. Like, really, he's not. Um, So that really surprised me. Um, It was very intimidating having a guy this close to my face. He would come this close. Big unit too. Big unit. Like, yeah, definitely could bench more than me, which, you know, (laughs) not not every guy can. I'll just throw that out there. But he's, he's right by my face and... You know, I don't usually have guys this close to my face. Like, you know, I, not very, very... Unless you're in a nightclub or something. Yeah, exactly. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm saying. Like, I don't generally invite men into this area. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is quite personal, let alone get anyone. This is my... But he would cut. He knew that, obviously. And to be more intimidating, he'd come right up here on multiple occasions and just, like, be yelling at you or, like, be, you know... Recruit 11, yes, stop. Like, you know, like he'd just be, he'd be right in my face. And I reckon the reason for that was in the pre interview, they'd said, What are you most scared of? And I said, Well, I'm scared that when the situations are, you know, really difficult, I love to bring a sense of humor to them to lighten the mood and to get the team together. You know, that's, all, that's how I did things in sport. That's how I am as a person, I guess. So I thought, I'm a bit nervous that maybe. I might laugh and it might get everyone into trouble, which I probably shouldn't have given the producers that idea. That was on me. I forgot it was reality TV and not a documentary. But anyway, um, I think like it was, uh, I think maybe I was lucky because I'm such a fan of the original show. I'd visualized many times and I would kind of knew what he was going to be like on the show. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was a very funny experience to have, to be, the person I'd watched so many times, you know, to be one of the people that I'd seen on YouTube on my laptop, just watching, you know, that, you know, um, and when he was there, I was just, I was just really focused. I say that whole time for the whole, you know, the whole hell week, I was just in a zone. I was in a zone. I was robotic. He told me on day four, you're being too much of a robot. Like I, I changed completely. I didn't know I had that in me, but I do just to be completely like you probably can't imagine it because we've been laughing this whole time yeah but i've got this side of me where i just go complete blank complete emotionless like just get the job done and oh. that's what i was showing them I yeah could, if someone was in my face that close i'd just be laughing my head off oh like, yeah so when yeah. when he did that like he started doing that to me i reckon like day one or day two there was one moment that was quite funny where i was actually nervous was he came real close to me again he was like here and he just did this with my shirt so he, and he comes right up to me and he's like and I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> In my head, I'm like, what the fuck? Like, what what what, what he's doing? And I ask, I ask one of the uh, one of the other recruits and transport to the location on the next one. I'm like, did you see what Ant was doing? Because he came up to like, because I, I didn't look, I didn't look at what he was doing. I didn't avert my gaze. I'm looking straight forward, like I did. I was soldier mode, and he's come right up on this direction and done something with my shirt. I'm like, what? <laughs> and uh, and. Um, Sandy, one of the recruits, goes, oh, he was just checking to see if you have your wet kit or your dry kit on because you have to wear, you have to get back into your wet kit. So that's what he was doing. But that was just like, that's definitely a 100%. Like in all the interviews, you can hear them talk about um, they're trying to make you as uncomfortable as possible. So I think he knew that for me, yeah, definitely it was intimidating having a guy like that big right up in right up in your space but the worst thing is i think because of my because of who i am as a person and obviously the culture and all that like i love hugging people <laughs> <laughs> and i just like oh there was so many occasions i would love to have given him a big hug and obviously i got a huge hug at the end from him and that that's i still can't believe i got to have that opportunity and, and hug you know hug him and uh that hug from him meant a lot to me because i felt like he really understood who i was that that's i never amazing. gave up and that he had a bit of respect and that was that was great yeah. earning respect from someone like that is pretty damn good so the stuff they yeah. said to me gave me so much confidence as you said like afterwards they all said you're so tough like you know and and the feedback i got from them was was really nice and that's made me feel like wow to have respect from these guys is mind-blowing to me and that's given me a lot of confidence to to go back to those things that i'd given up on and to give them another shot yeah, yeah i love it izzy this segment is called weird but true 
I had my hair in cornrows and I was in uh, Townsville. I was working on a mango farm that's been pretty fun. And uh, <laughs> this old couple who were, sorry, I shouldn't call them old, but older couple who gave me a lift. And I was talking to the man who was driving and he was ex-army and, uh, you know, we're talking about, I said, oh, I did a mock SAS selection course. And he's like, oh, did that happen to be on TV? I'm like, well, actually it did. Yeah, I was, uh, I had the cornrows. Uh, I was recruit 11 on the civilian series. And then Bindi up the back just pipes in. She comes to the front. She goes, you were the little chick. And then he goes, you were the little chick. And they're like, we were screaming at you. Like, we loved you. Like, you were the shortest one left. You were the smallest one left. And you just kept going. You had so much grit. And it was so nice. Like, it blew my mind that I was up north in the middle of Townsville. And this couple who were from a farm, like, again, in that vicinity, watched me, actually saw me on the show, saw who I was, despite some editing changes, you know, (laughs) saw who I was thought I was determined, thought I was gritty, and we're like, damn, we love your determination, we love your teamwork, we love your integrity, and, you know, you've just gone out there and given it your best shot, and uh, they wanted to see me get to the end. That's amazing. Absolutely was, and it blew my mind. I was so humbled. That was, like, the most humbling thing of SAS. That was the most, uh, when that happened, I thought, no way, because these these aren't my friends or my family, even though, obviously, now they're my friends, but, like, they had no bias towards me, but they just saw this girl, this little chick on and the show. And determination. And yeah, they yeah. saw that. And that's this uh, video clip right here. I'm in the car with uh, Sandy and Jeff. Woohoo! Woo-hoo. Celebrity! <laughs> Can you just tell me, please, what you said before, Sandy, about watching SAS Australia? We were watching SAS Australia and we used to cheer on with Jeff Collar, the little chick. The little chick Got a little chick, got a little chick. She's she's awesome. We could never remember your number. <laughs> Number 11. So you, these, thank you so much. I was having these people. (laughs) (laughs) Jeff. That's amazing. Jeff and Sandy from Townsville or from the near vicinity of Townsville, thank you for your kind words and (laughs) thank you for your support and thank you for everyone who supported me on the show. Like, I've been blown away by the messages I've got and that's pretty much been the overall message is you're so tough and that's that to have that feedback and that you know from people around australia has been yeah really and even a lot of my overseas friends who i shared the the links with have, have said that and yeah i'm so really cool. grateful for that yeah i'm really grateful well izzy rossitano we could speak all day but yep. thanks so much for coming <laughs> coming on legends of bevo for a chat and um, well done to everything you've done so far obviously with this sas and and all the other things you've you've um, uh, just blown me away i don't know you know what to say because you've just done so much and there's so much to look forward to because you're still so young and wish you all the best in the future and we look forward to keeping in touch oh that's very kind well thanks bevo thanks for having me i appreciate it and uh i can't wait to hear your rap (laughs) yeah